Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Ben, and today I'm going to be talking about three works by Jane Austen, sort of. Now, I say sort of because one of the books that I read uh, was a reworking of Jane Austen, um, taking her words and then adding, uh, or the author adding his own, uh, and that would be Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which I'll get to in just a little bit. Um, these were all read for Jane Austen July, uh, something I didn't really participate in last week, last year, uh, but it conveniently lined up with things that I wanted to read anyway this year, so I really went fully into it. Earlier this month I had read two other books um, that were part of the prompts. Uh, there was um, Zofloya or the Moor, um, a gothic novel from 1806. And this was, uh, one of the prompts was reading uh, a contemporary of Jane Austen. So that fulfilled that. And also to read a book about Jane Austen's time period. Um, and that was, uh, that was fulfilled by this book. Um, Sexuality and the Gothic Magic Lantern, Desire, Eroticism, and Literary Visibilities from Byram to Bran Stoker. Um, I made a video already about both of those, um, if you were interested in them. Uh, the other, uh, uh, three of the other prompts that um, I fulfilled was to read one of Jane Austen's six main novels. Um, for that, I actually listened to on, on Audible. I listened to Mansfield Park. That was the only of her uh, six proper novels that I hadn't read yet. And I'll talk about that one uh, towards the end of this video. Um, but before all that, I had read this. And this was to read a work of Jane Austen's that was not part of her six main novels. So this one, Jane Austen's The History of England, being a uh, sorry, by a partial, prejudiced, and ignorant historian. Note, there will be very few dates in this history. Um, this is a piece of juvenilia. She wrote this when she was um, in her teens. I think she's around 16 years old. And she is essentially creating a parody of the English histories that she would have grown up with. Um, things that would have been kind of published around her time period. And, uh, yeah, she gives little, little biographies of monarchs. Um, and... She does so um, really as a character. Uh, it is not her. Uh, she does it as a woman who is highly prejudiced um, in favor of Catholics and the Stuarts and a lover of Mary, Queen of Scots, um, and doesn't have much patience at all for, uh, for Protestant monarchs, and especially Queen Elizabeth. Um, so it is not Jane Austen herself that, you know, we're, we're hearing from. It is a character that she's creating, um, and a character who doesn't really know much about history at all. Uh, so it makes for a very, you know, fun, witty read. I think I probably would have gotten a lot more out of it if I had a stronger understanding of some of the English monarchs that she was talking about. Um, but, you know, she, this, the voice that she has, this character, um, you know, if, if a, if a monarch, if, if a queen or something like that was pretty, then she automatically assumes that she was probably good and, you know, she would never lie because look, look how pretty she was. Uh, it's, it's, it's those sorts of things. Um, now, th this is a facsimile in here. So um, we have Jane Austen's writing, but then her one of her sisters actually did the pictures, and they purposely made the pictures not really match up with what, um, what you're reading about. Like, I believe um, this is, uh, what is this? Edward the Fourth, or something like that. I think this is the one who she remarks was incredibly handsome. Um, so her her sister, you know, personally made him not look very handsome. Uh, yeah. So we have the contrast going on. We have, you know, bad judgments. We have a certain obliviousness to uh, to the whole thing. So this is something that you know her and her siblings could just kind of go back read and, and chuckle at. So in addition to the facsimile, they did. Uh, thankfully give us a, a transcript, you know, at, at the back. Um, and it, it was, a, it's a very quick read. Uh, you know, I read this in, in no time at all, but it, you know, you, you can definitely see her wit at work. Um, you can see where her later wit would really shine. You know, she was already starting to hone that craft at an early age. Um, and this was fun. I liked it. Um, you know, if, if I had a stronger, yeah, I knew some of the monarchs that she talked about. Um, if I had a much firmer grasp of some of the history that she was parodying, I probably would have gotten even more out of it. But even with my limited knowledge, I was picking up on jokes and uh, having a good chuckle here and there. Um, so I, I did enjoy this. Um, after that, I read Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. 
um, which fulfilled the prompts. It was read, I think, an, a, an adapted work um, of Jane Austen. Uh, so, you know, it, it could be uh, like almost like a fan fiction sort of thing, or um, it can be, I guess, like Bridget Jones' diary or, you know, things that are reworkings of her work. Uh, so th that's what I did for this. And I'm a horror fan. Um, and I also do like Jane Austen. I thought this would be a fun read. I had originally picked this up a long time ago, actually. And I was originally going to read this after I had read Pride and Prejudice. Um, I had gone through a bunch of Jane Austen's novels, at least five of them. Um, the only one I didn't get to, and this is about 10 years ago, uh, was Mansfield Park. Um, and instead of reading Mansfield Park, I picked this up. But it was, parts of it were just so close. I mean, they literally are parts of Pride and Prejudice. I just felt like I was reading Pride and Prejudice again uh, at, at that point, and I was just kind of getting a little bit burnt out on, you know, the Austin uh, Regency <laughs> era, so I couldn't finish it then. Um, and coming back to it did help. Um, it was a little bit better. So what um, Seth Graham Smith has done here, uh, he's taken Pride and Prejudice, which of course is public domain, you can do whatever you want to the text, uh, and he's reworked it um, and added bits about, of course, zombies, um, you know, and, but this is really, it's less of a horror novel, uh, and it's more like a mashup of Jane Austen and, like, 1970s, like, you know, Hong Kong kung fu cinema. Um, it, that actually seems to play even more heavily than the zombies. The zombies just kind of show up here and there. Most of this book is just Pride and Prejudice, um, you know, and he, he changes some things here and there. Every so often there's zombies being killed, but the zombies really don't affect the plot hardly at all. Um, there's a little bit with, like, Charlotte Lucas and, uh, you know, <laughs> a few things here and there, but, but really, it's just, it's Pride and Prejudice, um, which I kind of have mixed feelings about. Um, you know, it, when you first start reading it like this, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, you get some good chuckles, but the gimmick does kind of wear a little bit, and it gets... A little bit tiring, kind of repetitive, you know, the the, the novelty wears off um, by about the halfway point. And, um, you know, I, I just kind of, I could do without the constant reminders of how uh, the Bennett sisters trained in China and stuff like that. Um, just stuff that didn't really add to the plot at all. Uh, however, by the uh, third act, there's some genuinely funny stuff with... Um, Oh, it, I'm, I'm blanking on some of the names here. Um, with uh, Wickham, right, Wickham. Um, the, that stuff had me had me cracking up. Uh, basically, his fate, like the kind of stuff that happens to him. Uh, there, there were some pretty funny moments with that. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's somewhat enjoyable. Um, I kind of wish that it deviated actually more from Pride and Prejudice um, and started telling its own story in a lot of ways. Uh, that I mean, it went more heavily on the horror and less on the kind of weird martial arts and bringing in things like ninjas and stuff like that, um, which is kind of funny on paper, but just doesn't make for a great story necessarily. Um, it did, however, you know, remind me of how much I like Pride and Prejudice um, and how well written that is. Uh, so next year, I know that this year there was kind of a, a big read along that was happening with Pride and Prejudice for Jane Austen July. Um, which I didn't participate in because I was already reading this. Although, like I said, I kind of felt like, in part at least, I reread Pride and Prejudice. But maybe next year I'll read the proper version. Um, so, you know, would I recommend this? Uh, maybe. You know, if, um, if you know, you can take that gimmick uh, and, you know, bear its repetition, um, then I think you could have a lot of fun with this. Um, however, I don't see myself going back and rereading it necessarily. Um, but for what it is, it was fine. So in addition to all of that, of course, um, I had read uh, Mansfield Park, or not read, you know, I use that in air quotes. I listened to it. Um, I do have a physical copy of Mansfield Park. However, as my entire library is packed up for a move, um, I did not have access to that physical copy. And I was wary of listening to it. Um, I had some very helpful uh, watchers of my channel, you know, let me know that it can be a more difficult book, um, that, you know, it might be best to have a physical copy. So I was a little bit wary and thinking, okay, will I be able to actually read this and follow everything along? And luckily, I think I actually 
was able to. Um, you know, I, I didn't I didn't end up having any difficulties at all that uh, that I perceived. Um, and uh, so uh, it's I know this is kind of a divisive book. Um, this is a uh, a book which you know a very small minority of Austin fans revere. Um, but I think that the majority of Austin fans consider it on the bottom of their list of favorites. Uh, I think it, it generally will rank low among most people. Um, and I can kind of see why. Uh, we have the main character of Fanny Price, who is unlike any of the other uh, Jane Austen heroines. Um, she is very meek, she is very quiet, she is very shy. I mean, you can argue that there are some others that are you know, also kind of shy and introspective. Um, but Fanny, you know, she's, she is a character, um, and this is where I'm going to kind of give, uh, you know, I will get a little bit spoilery in this, um, but I'm going to try to stay away from any kind of major spoilers, really, but I'll speak as generally as possible. Um, I think that she was incredibly well written as far as being a character who has suffered a lot of trauma, uh, basically abuse. Uh, she comes from, I don't want to say a poor background, uh, she's, I guess, middle class, um, and she goes to live with her, her aristocratic uh, aunt and uncle, and her cousins who are all a little bit older, um, and she immediately has something, you can see something of an inferiority complex, um, this, this family who has decided to take her in uh, has done so, and they, they are committed to provide for her, but they never want her to forget her humble beginnings, um, that every single thing that they offer her should be received with the utmost gratitude and thanks, uh, that she is not of their class. Um, and that comes about in various ways by various characters and various family members. Some of them are far more cruel with this than others. But it creates a situation where you have a girl, she's 10 years old at the time, um, taken from her home uh, and brought into a place where she is constantly put down um, and, uh, you know, made to kind of act as something of a servant um, in a lot of ways for uh, for these aristocratic um, relatives, uh, some of whom are intentionally cruel and some of them are just kind of oblivious. Um, you know, there is the one kind, real kind cousin, um, Edward, who does become something of a love interest. Uh, you know, so we do have that hanging over this, um, a love story between cousins. Uh, not something that we, of course, would uh, abide today. Uh, but in Jane Austen's time, we have to remember that was something that was completely acceptable. Um, and as romances go, you know, of course, when you go into a Jane Austen book, you expect a romance. But I don't think this is the best way to approach this book. Um, there is a romance in there, but it's kind of besides the point. And in many ways, it feels like an afterthought. Um, I think this is far better just seen as a, a character study. Um, so the main setting is Mansfield Park. We're not always in that one location, um, but it is the, the adhesive locale uh, that holds everything together. And the first like third or so of the book, it can be a little bit difficult to get into. Uh, Fanny Price is mostly in the background, um, so much so that at times she's kind of a non-entity. Uh, she doesn't feel like the main protagonist in a lot of ways. Um, and again, it's called Mansfield Park. It's not called Fanny Price. So I think it's best to approach the book as something of an ensemble, uh, more so than some of the other, or at least as far as my memory serves, the other Jane Austen books that I've read. Um, the other characters are much more prominent in the first third, especially. Uh, Fanny Price starts to get a little more prominent in the middle. Um, and, you know, the, the first third feels like a lot of setup. Uh, that's the other thing. Something like Pride and Prejudice, you're thrown right into the narrative. Uh, you're thrown right into dialogue and you're you're finding out about characters through their interactions and what they're saying. And I feel like in the beginning uh, of Mansfield Park, there's a lot more telling rather than showing. Um, and that can get a little bit, you know, you just kind of want things to move, move along. It doesn't feel like you're really halfway through the book before by the time like the real plot starts hitting the ground and you're going through. Um, and I will say, you know, amidst this, um, there are some incredibly well-crafted scenes. Uh, she, she, you know, by she, I mean Austin, 
um, is brilliant at writing characters. Uh, she really is. And there are some great moments of dialogue in here, uh, great character moments, some genuinely funny moments sometimes, a little bit of farce, uh, you know, um, that are very effective. Uh, and there's a lot of speculation or um, uh, the, the thematic playing with ideas of morality. This is a very moral, moralizing story. Uh, a lot of things like, you know, um, does, you know, is morality more, um, more acutely proper in the countryside versus the city, uh, among the aristocrats versus the lower classes? Uh, does, you know, a, a religious leader, um, does their example help to create more morality or not? Uh, these are kind of questions that seem to be played with. I will say, though, that at the end, you know, the last two chapters just kind of feel like this is where it kind of comes down to peg for me. Um, it presents a lot of interesting questions with morality, but I think it gives us overly simplistic answers. And we have things that happen in the plot that are just kind of overly convenient in order to deliver a kind of pat moral message. Uh, you know, it's like the, the bad people get their just desserts for the most part. Uh, the good people live happily. Um, you know, uh, characters who are given some good complexity and nuance, like the Crawfords, Mary Crawford and Henry Crawford, uh, they're incredibly interesting characters uh, that we sort of see different growth and we're, we're trying to figure out exactly what they're all about. Um, they're, they're sort of like villains in the story, but you see that, you know, they're, they have moments of like genuine kindness and they're not like just patently wicked. Um, but then at the very end, we see some things that, you know, we, we don't even see it. We hear about it. We hear about these characters and, you know, uh, certain things that they, they say or do, and that just kind of decides it for us morally, um, in a way that just kind of felt a little bit too too Russian black and white um, for my taste. Um, and, you know, by the second half of the book, we are starting to focus more and more on Fanny. Uh, Fanny, it becomes our main, our main uh, heroine, our protagonist. And, uh, you know, her stuff was quite interesting. Um, I liked how at one point she does go back home. Um, you know, by home, I mean her parents' house, this very large family, this very large middle-class family. They have, like, these two kind of servants still, so they're not, like, dirt poor. But, um, you know, it's kind of like it, it, Jane Austen writes it as though it's this, you know, girl who is being brought up in privilege goes home to the trailer park. Um, and the kids are running around, you know, uh, uh, with... It's, it's like chaos reigns and um I, I felt like there was i felt a lot of classism in those passages um and i don't mean obviously we're dealing with a different social class but it felt like the family uh her family was sort of being condemned by the narrator um for being poor uh <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know if that's an oversimplification, but, um, it was a very distasteful view of the lower class, and I kind of wish that there was something a little bit more, um, a little bit more balanced and hopeful, uh, when we look at, you know, the, the kind of struggles that that class would have been going through, and, um, you know, maybe paint them in a little bit of a better picture. Although in this book, the aristocratic class doesn't necessarily come off clean. Um, you know, a lot of them come off incredibly selfish, uh, and, you know, self-serving and hurting others. So no, nobody gets out of this really, um, clean. And that's one of the things about this book is it's hard to find a likable character. Um, Fanny Price is, she's nice. Is she a compelling character? No, not necessarily. Um, her love interest, Edward, pretty dull guy, <laughs> I gotta say. Um, you know, the most exciting characters are the people that we're supposed to not really like. Um, but they're the ones that every time they come on the page, you're a little bit like, oh, yay, you know, these people again. Uh, but for the most part, nobody's really likable in this book. Um, so, uh, you know, my, my feelings of this were kind of mixed. Um, I recognize the craft. Um, the writing is very good at certain points. Um, you know, I mean, Jane Austen couldn't write a bad sentence. Uh, the character studies are often very good, uh, but the overall plot was just kind of, eh. Um, it didn't really, it didn't really, uh, do much for me. 
Um, so anyhow, that's my uh, that's my take on Mansfield Park. Um, I've never officially ranked the uh, Jane Austen novels. Um, I feel like I'd have to kind of go through them again to properly do that. Uh, when I read the other ones about 10 years ago, um, Persuasion ranked really high. Pride and Prejudice did as well. Um, you know, I really like Northanger Abbey is also. Sense and Sensibility, I guess, was kind of somewhere in the middle. And Emma, I don't remember really liking, um, but I think a lot of the humor was maybe lost on me when I was reading it. Uh, and also, that's the only book where, like, um, every other book has some traveling in it, like they're going places and Emma just kind of stayed in this one village the whole time and it just felt like too much like people just sitting around talking uh, for a very long book. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'd have to go back and reread Emma. Um, so as things stand, I kind of would put this kind of closer to Emma. Uh, this would be lower on the list, not because I think it's a bad book, I absolutely don't, um, but it's just in comparison to the other Jane Austen works just wasn't nearly as, uh, you know, it, as effective for me. Um, so anyway, those are my thoughts on Mansfield Park. Um, and of course, also my earlier thoughts on Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and A History of England. Um, so if you've read any of these, as usual, I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, and also, as always, thank you, BookTube.